It's certainly my privilege this evening to introduce Pastor Mike Fabares. Mike is the founding pastor of Compass Bible Church in Alyssa Viejo, California. Mike and his wife, Carolyn, grew up in Long Beach, California, attending high school together and then the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Pastor Mike graduated from Moody with a bachelor's degree in Bible and theology. Mike and Carolyn also attended the University of Arizona, with Carolyn receiving her bachelor's degree in education. Pastor Mike earned his master's degree from Talbot Seminary of Theology and a doctorate from Westminster Theological Seminary in California. Carolyn and Mike have two grown sons, Matthew and John, and a teenage daughter, Stephanie. Mike is the president of Compass Bible Institute and is heard on hundreds of stations on the Focal Point radio program, which happens to be my wife's favorite, even more than grace to you. He is the author of several books, including Getting It Right, Why the Bible, Praying for Sunday, Preaching That Changes Lives, Saturday's Hope, Bible Survey for Kids, Beyond Bible Basics, Resolve to Follow Christ, Lifelines for Tough Times, Raising Men, Not Boys, and 10 Mistakes People Make About Heaven, Hell, and the Afterlife. Now, on a bit more personal note, it's been my privilege to hear Mike speak on multiple occasions at Countryside Bible Church in Texas, and even to share the same living room with uh, he and his wife in the home of Tom Pennington, Countryside's pastor. Now, though Micah said many memorable things in his sermons, the quote I most often use with our college and youth students comes from that living room and not from Mike, but from his wife. And the quote goes something like this. I, I think I've got it right. She said when talking about relationships that students pursuing relationships are often like two ticks looking for a dog. <laughs> Few truer words have ever been spoken. <laughs> Additionally, our church has benefited greatly from the use of Mike's excellent resource for discipleship, the Partners Workbook, which in our congregation has uh, many have taken and have the privilege of working through over these past several of years. So I commend Mike to you as a man who loves the Word of God. He loves Christ and his church. He's committed to seeing that prayer undergirds his ministry at all times. So please welcome Mike as he comes. Well, I suppose like most men, my best quotes come from my wife. So that has been revealed. Imagine how inferior I feel coming into the pulpit tonight, even after such a impressive introduction, because I just watched your preacher move from the choir to the pulpit. I looked up and saw him sing. I thought, what is he doing? Most pastors dare not get near the choir. The, I mean, most of us are known for doing one, one kind of thing. And uh, so I, I feel like I need to go take some singing lessons, and I feel, I feel bad because I can't sing. And most people are known for one thing, right? You think about it. Uh, if you run into Mike Trout uh, back in Orange County and you're wanting to hit a baseball better, you probably want to talk to him at some point about hitting a baseball. You run into Jordan Spieth, you want to swing a golf club, you can probably get a few tips from him. You'd be wise to do that. If you are trying to make uh, better free throws, you run into Steph Curry, you might want to ask him about how to improve your form from the free throw line. Um, most people are known for one thing, one primary thing that they're really good at. And if I were to get Jesus here in the room in person and say he's coming to your house tonight and you've got a chance to learn from Christ, I wonder what you'd ask him. What would you want him to instruct you on? What would you want him in your life to improve? If you had a chance to get his insight, you might say, certainly I would say, Jesus, teach me how to preach better. I might say, a lot of issues with trying to apply the Bible in people's lives in the counseling office. God, Jesus, teach me how to, to be a better counselor. You're, you're so good at that. Teach me how to resist temptation. I mean, you, you fight the devil in the wilderness and you prevail. Teach me how to do that. I mean, there's so many things we could ask Jesus about and how do we do this better. But there's a great line when the apostles get Jesus by himself and they asked him something that you would not expect because not many are known for being good at this. But they said to Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Teach us how to pray. What a strange question that is. Think about it. Teach us how to pray. I mean, little kids know how to pray, don't they? No, teach us how to pray like you pray. You pray in a way that is apparently outstanding. It's notable. You're known for prayer, and we've got a chance to learn from you. We'd sure like 
you to teach us how to pray. Which, by the way, the best preacher of your day, you said about him, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. And they said, teach us how to pray just like John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. It is interesting, the more you get past the layer of the public persona of the real spiritual heavyweights of church history, they are really good at praying. I wonder how many people will come to you and say, well, I've noticed your Christian life, and the one thing I want to learn from you is how to pray. You might say how to sing, how to preach, how to counsel, how to be righteous, whatever you might be known for, but how great would it be for us to be like Christ? Isn't that the goal? We would like to be conformed to the image of Christ. And Christ was known to be a man of prayer, an exceptional man of prayer. And he laid down the example for us Martin Luther said, it's the job of the tailor to make clothes. It's the task of the cobbler to make shoes. And it is the job of the Christian to pray. But in our day, we are so busy. Right? You're busy. I mean, who doesn't say they're busy? Everyone's busy. Over 100 years ago, D.L. Moody would take the very busy businessmen of Chicago and sit them down and say, listen... You claim to follow Christ. If you have so much business to attend to that you have no time to pray, well, then you just have too much business. And if you're too busy to pray, then I can tell you by the authority of Christ, if you claim Christ, then you're just too busy. You're going to have to fix that. This weekend, we're going to try to talk about prayer and making it a part of your life in a way that it wasn't last week, like it wasn't last month. We'd like this next year of your life to be a life of prayer in a way that it wasn't last year. And the pivotal moment is really going to come down to the beginning of what we're going to talk about this weekend. It's a decision that you make. It's a resolve that you make. One of the books that he mentioned, a little book about resolve, resolved to follow Christ. There is so much in Scripture and so much in church history about everything hinging from a human perspective on people saying this is what I'm going to do this one thing I'm going to do this is what I'm going to master this is what I'm going to focus on this will be my priority as someone once looked at me and said which really changed everything about my life it's the reason I'm here preaching to you tonight I would not be a preacher if this Christian had not said to me we have enough Christians that dabble in a lot of things what we need are Christians that do one thing and do it well and sadly in my life, and it's not with any false humility that I say this, the thing I'm known for is not prayer. And I wish that it were. Jesus was a great preacher, but he was known for prayer. I'm sure that you may have a lot of things that you're notable for in your small group, in your Sunday school class, in your church. But all of it will flow with a kind of power and effectiveness and fruitfulness if you and I can be men and women of prayer. So take your Bibles tonight as we start with something that I think is just fundamental. As a matter of fact, you're going to accuse me of not even being an expositor tonight because I'm just going to look at just a couple of words here and say there's so much in the sentences of Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2, that we can hardly get past just the simplicity of what's being said here because it's not the difficulty of understanding what's required for you and I to be men and women of prayer. It's, It's the doing. It's not the knowing. We have got to respond to this imperative. It is so simple. It is so straightforward. And yet, how disobedient of us as Christians if we were to walk out the doors of this building tonight and we don't do what this says. Look at it. You've got the text right in front of you. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. I mean, just look at those first four words here for us in English. Devote yourselves to prayer. Let's just start with that. Devote yourself to prayer. If I were to take you to stand you before the beam seat of Christ, and Christ is going to evaluate your life, and he's going to open up the books, and let's just say one of the books that he opens up is the book of Colossians, and he says, hey, you read this? I mean, there's no one in the room who hasn't read this, right? You've all read this. You've read this multiple times. And it stares at you every time you read it. And the call is devote yourselves to prayer. It's not a call to any special class of Christians, not a call to any special role in the Christian uh, church. it's, It's a call to every Christian. Devote yourselves to prayer. 
I just wonder if you could stand before Christ and say, I did that. I did that. I, I did what you said. I didn't just do it out of duty. I didn't just do it out of some kind of, of obligation. I wasn't just trying to check a box. I, I took the simple instruction of this text and, and I, I did it. But like a lot of resolves in our life that are for good, you probably can't look back at, oh, I did it when I was 18. I did it when, you know, when I was 26. You, you've got to make this a continual kind of devotion. Matter of fact, that is what is said in Acts chapter 1 about the early church. Even before the falling of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 and chapter 1, it is the same word in the text that they were gathered together, 120 of them in one place, and they were devoting themselves to prayer. Very simple. It's really not the knowing, it's the doing. It's the responsiveness. It's the obedience. It's saying it doesn't matter how busy we are, I'm going to devote myself to prayer. So, again... At the risk of being accused of not following every word of this text, I just want to say, well, what does the word prayer mean? And just step back and say, in the Bible, what do we see in terms of prayer? If I'm going to devote myself to this thing called prayer, what is it? Because there's lots of different kinds of prayer, and there are. But let's just get down to two categories. If I'm going to recommit myself, and let's just call it that, I'm just recommitting myself tonight to say, I, I'm going to be an obedient Christian. I'm going to look at Colossians 4, 2, and I'm going to do what it says. And it says I ought to be devoted to prayer. I've done that before. I hope you've done it before. So let's just say for most of us, we're going to recommit ourselves to be praying Christians. What am I recommitting myself to? A couple things. Let's understand it's a kind of prayer that the world is not engaged in. Do you know that 70% of Americans in just about every survey, and it fluctuates, I've read several of them, anywhere between 70, 78%, depends on what survey you're reading, they say they pray. They pray. I mean, we don't have 70 to 78% Christians in this country, right? We don't. But Americans say they pray. As a matter of fact, here's a stat that'll blow your mind. 30% of atheists say they pray occasionally. I've got a few follow-up questions on that, right? <laughs> what? In that same survey, it says 17% of atheists pray regularly. I mean, I can see an atheist, maybe, oops, I didn't mean to do that, but yeah, I, I, I pray occasionally. You've got 17% of atheists saying they pray regularly. There's a lot going on when the creature cries out intuitively and reflexively to the creator. Whatever that might be. I'm not devoted to you. I don't love you. I'm not submitted to you. I don't want to do what you say. But I feel like my back is against the wall, and I'm going to say, oh, God, protect my kids on the way to school. Oh, I read a news report, and I'm afraid of what might happen to my finances. I, I mean, there's a lot of that going on. You understand that. I'm not talking about that. I don't want us just to say that's prayer. That's, that's not the kind of prayer that we're talking about in the Bible. And I'll prove it to you. Was it not in Scripture the pattern? For us to not only pray for our daily bread, but the example of Christ to give thanks to God, to bless the Father, to bless God for the bread that we receive. Right? I mean, you can nod and smile at me if that's true. It's not a trick question, right? That, that's, yeah, you're right. We should pray and be thankful for our daily bread. We should ask for it. He provides it. All good things come from him. So if we fill our belly, if you've got stuff running through your GI tract right now, you should be thankful for that. Okay, here's a stat. Now think about this. 17% of atheists say they pray regularly. Guess what the statistics are of people that say they pray before their meals? What, what do you think? Pick a number in your head. It's probably lower. Okay, pick that number, reduce it. What's the number? 1%. Okay. You know one thing I don't want to do before I eat? I don't want to pray. I want to eat. That's why I'm here. That's why we made the stuff. That's why I went to the restaurant. You delivered it. I don't want to bow my head and put my nose closer to it and smell it right now. I want to eat it. It's not convenient to pray right now. So whatever the world's doing that they call prayer, that's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible says we ought to be thankful for everything. He gives us life and breath and everything else. Acts chapter 17. Everything comes from God. We ought to be grateful. He's the giver of all good things. And Jesus said, here's what we ought to do. We get bread, we ought to bless the Lord. We ought to thank God for it. We ought to credit him with that. 
That's the example of Scripture. And I could argue, I think, it's not only just the description of godly people, it is embedded in the prescription of what Christians should do. And I'm saying that's a kind of praying that's not reflexive, it's not intuitive, it's not, well, yeah, I read a bad story. I don't want my kids to get, you know, get kidnapped on the way to school. So I asked God. I don't even believe in God. I don't even know if there is a God. But I prayed. Every Christian prays like that. When they're scared, they pray. When they have a need, they pray. When they get sick, they pray. When they're afraid, they pray. I'm not talking about devoting yourself to that. That's not what Paul's saying, devote yourself to. It's at least two categories of prayer that it's going to take a devoted commitment. And let's talk about the first one, which sounds easy, but it's not. I'll give it a title, I'll give it a phrase, and I'll quote passages, and you know these passages. This is a well-educated congregation. I know you guys know the Bible, but let me give you my heading here. Let's just call it this, conversational praying. And by that, I don't mean a kind of group prayer where we all just throw out one-liners. Or I'm talking about the kind of praying. As a matter of fact, if you want to be a little bit more modern, let's just call it this. It's, it's the kind of texting praying. Let's call it that. Right? It's, it's the kind of praying that is a reaction to what Jesus said we ought to be doing, what Paul said we ought to be doing, with our minds continually coming back habitually to express my thoughts to God. To pray, right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, without ceasing. If I prayed without ceasing, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. Well, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about that periodic, like a hacking cough. You know when you have that cough and you can't get rid of it? Get that sickness and just it hangs on and you hack, hack. It's not like you're, you're going, <laughs> right? No, you just bam. And then you can say a few lines and then it's bam. And then you try to answer, you know, an email and it's bam, you're coughing. It's just, it just keeps going. It's like Nehemiah when asked the question, when the king asked the question and it says he prayed to the Lord and answered. That's just a, a bang. It's a quick thought directed to God it's as simple as God help me here God give me wisdom here you know how many times you checked your phone today if you're the average American don't even get me started with teenagers but if you're the average American guess how many times you checked your phone today over 200 by this time of the night over 200 times right you can't go five minutes without checking your phone that's the average five minutes and don't even get me started with my kids right it just is off the charts and what's with that well you know a lot of it is getting information but if you ever remember back in the days when you got the the cell phone bill if you're if you just hit it just right where they used to itemize all the texts on that and you had kids that were old enough to have a phone and they had a phone it was like what in the world are you doing right uh, you, you can't write a three-page paper, but you've just written a 27-page texting report, right, of, of just the time and, and, and day that you've texted. It, it's just this periodic communication. I know we go to our phones to find out what's going on, right? You're creeping on people by watching what they're doing and what they're wearing and where do they go, and I know how you are. <laughs> but there's a lot of texting that goes on. And you're just popping these, and and I do a lot when I travel, right? Today, I've texted so many people so many times, just, hey, here's what's happening, here's what's going on. It's that constantly getting back, it's that connection. And you ought to be committing yourself to that. You ought to be saying, just like Nehemiah did, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, when the king asked him a question, he couldn't help, but it's just reflexive. He goes back to it, but he does it because it's a purposeful part and a resolved part of his life. Everything he knows is dependent on the Lord. It says, and he prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king. I just think that that's a kind of prayer. I, I don't even know what that, what that sounds like. It's just a quick response. And yet, hopefully on my good days, I do know what that's about. My mind just continually going back to express myself to God. I'd like you to commit yourself to that kind of texting. I want you to be like that teenager with page after page after page after page after page of one-liners you've thrown out to God. God, forgive me for not praying without ceasing. Forgive me for not praying as much as I'm texting, praying as much as I'm talking to someone. It's like driving down the road with someone that you love sitting in the seat next to you. I mean, it's not like you're, you're just filling every blank space with words, but you're not going very far at all without directing your thoughts and your, your words to them. 
I mean, you're periodically talking the whole way unless you have a bad marriage or I don't know, you just, you're really an introvert. Most of us were chit-chatting the whole time. I sat at dinner with the pastors and, 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 and Pastor Ramey and, and we just all talked. We didn't sit there in silence. We just kept talking. That's how it works. And so it is that we commit ourselves to talk to the God who gives us life and breath and everything else, who promises to do things in our life. It changes everything when we start to commit ourselves to that kind of conversational praying. And for the sake of alliteration, and I didn't even go to Dallas Seminary. Sorry. That's, just, that's a fun joke to tell with an educated crowd. Um, conversational praying, let's call it this, concentrated praying. The concentrated praying that we see throughout the Bible, and this is the hardest kind. Because some of you say, oh, I'm feeling pretty good so far. No, not a lot of conviction. You're right, I haven't really resolved myself to pray lately. But man, I talked to God several times today, so I'm feeling pretty good. It's this kind of praying. It's the Luke 5, 16. He would withdraw, speaking of Jesus, to desolate places and pray. Mark 1, 35. Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he went off to work out. No, that's not what it says. He, he went off to do what? To pray. Matthew 14, 23. He had dismissed the crowds and he went to the mountain by himself and he prayed. That's that concentrated kind of praying. I think some of you can sit here and say, I talked to God several times to get today. I threw, I threw several lines out to God. But again, I don't want to rely too much on stats, but the stats are helpful. They're revealing and they're sad. 50% of all Christians, self-reporting Christians, say that they don't pray more than five minutes a day. And you know, everyone's lying on those surveys anyway. So I'm sure it's less than 50%. But self-reporting, 50% say, I, I didn't pray for more than five minutes. I remember early in my Christian life, singing a song in chapel at school, Sweet Hour of Prayer, which I thought was kind of a sappy, sentimental song. Until one day I asked myself, have I, even, have I ever even prayed for an hour straight? And back then I didn't, you know, have an iPhone or a digital timer. But I, I got a hold of an egg timer and I turned it on. And every five minutes I kept checking it, thinking it's got to be an hour by now. It's hard to pray for an hour. And yet Jesus looked at Peter, James, and John and said, you can't even watch and pray with me for an hour? Ooh. Now the sermon's getting convicting. Think about that. Jesus expects us to have a solid hour of prayer and be like, oh, that's no big deal. I mean, he's really ripping on his disciples for not being able to pray for an hour. How are you going to do that? Well, I guess you can just have to start doing the kinds of things Jesus did, withdrawing to desolate places to pray, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. He went off to pray, dismissing the crowds. He went up by the mountain, on the mountain by himself and he prayed. How about Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, he got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed. How good can a long distance relationship be if all you have is texting? Don't you need some FaceTime, some Skyping? Right? Think about that. I don't know how I started. I did a long distance dating relationship with my now wife. We dated for almost five years and part of that time I was in Chicago and she was in Southern California and that's when you, know, you had to pay for every minute on long distance. But I think now my kids have it so good and I've had my kids have to have their relationships apart like that, but they've got texting and then they've also got that, that, that technology to turn on a camera and just face that laptop screen and to converse. So I guess if we're going to update this, there needs to be a commitment to a texting relationship with God and then there needs to be a a commitment to a, to a FaceTime, Skyping relationship with God. And I'm saying this, have you Skyped with him today? How long did that happen? 50% of Christians, self-reporting, say not more than five minutes. What kind of relationship are you going to have with someone? You say you love them, you're devoted to them, you care about them, you want to talk to other people about this person. And all day long, they're available anytime, anytime. They're available. Not only available, they say, please come and talk to me. And we, we can't give them five minutes. Not hard to bring conviction 
in a weekend conference about prayer. I understand that. I mean, it's built in. I don't need a big introduction to hook you into this, thinking, hey, Christian, you need to pray. But what's the goal of this point? The goal of this point is to do what it says, devote yourselves to prayer. Could you at least right now in your heart, you could blow me off, or you could be responsive to this sermon, and you could say, you're right, I need to devote myself to praying. I'm just giving you a target. It's not the kind of thing that the world does. When they pray when their back is against the wall, it's a kind of, I'm going to text you. I am going to FaceTime you. I am going to be in this focused relationship where I'm committing myself to do something that is not intuitive. It's only intuitive if I really love God, if I really am devoted to talking to this God. Recommit yourself to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. You still have Colossians 4 open? Here's the next line. Keeping alert in it. Keeping alert in it. There's a key, and I've already talked about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross, telling Peter, James, and John to watch and pray. It's not just pray, watch and pray. And that's the picture, and surely Paul has that in view here. I mean, Peter reflects the same thing in his epistles. There's a sense in which you need to guard this time. You need to be alert in your praying. You need to be, be watchful. What does that mean? It means you need to guard that communication time. So far, if you're tracking what I'm trying to say here, number one, you certainly need to recommit yourself to praying. Number two, you need to guard that prayer time. It's one thing for us to say, yes, I'm going to commit myself to praying. I'm going to do what Colossians 4.2 says. But now I'm going to say you're going to have to work hard to play defense to keep that happening. Not going to happen without a good defense. John Chrysostom said it well. The devil knows how effective, how powerful right, praying is. Therefore, he presses hard against you when you pray. And it's true. I mean, there's a kind of weakness in us already inherent. That's why Jesus said, the spirit may be willing, right? And he said, it is in your case, but the flesh is weak. And you know what? We got an enemy that's more than the flesh. We've got the devil and the devil's working hard to press against you. I think Chrysostom's right. He's a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And the best way to devour someone in the Christian life is to separate them from that communication with God. When my brother and I were kids, we used to play with army men, those little green plastic guys. Right? My brother was four and a half years older than it was. He still is. I can't catch him. Um, but we would pick teams. I don't know if that's how you play. There was no instructions in the bag of army men, but we would pick the guys. And, you know, he was the kind that would watch the war movies on Saturday morning, and I, I wouldn't. I don't care about that. You know, give me Bugs Bunny or Beverly Hillbillies or whatever. Um, but he was into it. Everything mattered. And there's all the different guys. There's the, guy, the sniper. There's the guy with the, the grenade launcher, right? And then there's one that I thought, why is this in the bag? It's a little guy with a phone and the antenna on his back, right? What's that guy doing in there? The guy's on the phone, right? My brother would pick that as though I'm paying attention to the rules of how this works. And it was important to have that little green guy with the phone. And I remember him talking at one point, listen, if you don't have that, right, you have no connection to the headquarters. You're sitting ducks. Now, he played a whole game in his mind that I didn't understand, but <laughs> I got the point. And that's true. Some of us are out there. We think we got the armor of God on. But we really don't. Well, we got some armor on. We're wielding the sword around. But you know, at the end of that list in Ephesians chapter 6, there's parallels to all the pieces of armor. The sword, the helmet, the breastplate, the shoes. You know the passage, right? Smile at me if you know the passage. You know the passage. At the end it says, after all those things and praying at all times in the spirit. It's almost like it doesn't it's it's almost such an important thing that now that I've given you all the analogies, I'm not even going to give an analogy. And then you need to always be praying. And then Paul turns as he often does in these letters, then pray for us. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. And I don't like to admit that I've watched Annie, but I've watched Annie. And I would never admit publicly that I liked watching Annie. But there was a cute song in the Annie, I mean, the original one with the little red-headed girl. I don't know if it was original. I guess it was on Broadway. But the one that I watched that was on VHS, how about that? What's that? Um, 
And they sang that song, You're Never Fully Dressed Without a Smile. Remember that? I'd sing it for you, but I'm not your pastor. <laughs> so it's a cute song. And they're showing back and forth from the studio and they're trying to find Annie's parents, of course. And then the kids are running around in the, in the uh, orphanage and they're singing and dancing. And it's cute. It's just a cute song. Never fully dressed without a smile. Right? You wear all the dapper clothes, but you're never fully dressed without a smile. I mean, that is the picture in Ephesians 6. You can get everything together in the Christian life. You can have the flamethrower, you can have the sniper, you can have the grenade guy that's tossing it, but you're never really ready to go to war. You're never really ready to teach a Sunday school class. You're never really ready to counsel a Christian. You're never really ready to go to someone's bedside who's suffering and give them godly encouragement. You're never really ready to face temptation in your life unless you have prayer. Praying at all times in the Spirit. You've got to pray. And that means you have to guard that prayer time. It's warfare. And again, again, I don't know. I wrote a book on preaching and, and I'm breaking all the rules, but... In this passage, what you have is being watchful or keeping alert in it. But what, can I just give you some practicals? If I'm going to sit down at my kitchen table with you and say, what are some things about prayer that, that can help you guard it? Let me give you five things real quick. These are just practical things. Okay? I'm not saying they're all embedded in this passage, but I see the patterns in Scripture. Here's the first one. Get a good place. Find a good place. I mean, I just quoted some passages. He would withdraw to desolate places, Luke 5, 16. Right? Or Matthew 14, 23. He would... Dismiss the crowds and go up to the mountain. He had a place to go. Jesus talked in Matthew 6, 6 about going into the inner room. Right? That was a, a room that was, it didn't have the distractions. Right? The, the, the closet. I remember finally, fi I finally bought a house after years of marriage that had a, a walk-in closet. And my wife loved that because she could go in there and shut the door and feel real godly that she's living out Matthew 6, 6. But that was her place to pray. And I thought, that's, that's, that's the inner room. It's quiet because all her clothes are hanging there and it's got no windows and her kids can't find her. And it's a place to pray. She has a place. Daniel, Daniel 6.10, he went up into the upper chamber. I mean, you could go throughout the scripture and find that people had their places to pray. And I just want to ask you, hey, you're going to devote yourself to prayer? That's a great thing. Then I'm going to say, guard that. And here's one way you guard that communication with God. You have a place to pray. Do you have a place to pray? Think right now. Do you? Where do you go to pray? Not the texting. You can text from anywhere. Where do you FaceTime with God? Where? If you don't have one, you need to have one. I'm just, I'm not, not, I'm not saying that with the authority of this text. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you got to be alert. If you're going to be alert and focused, if you're going to be watchful, one thing that helps, and I just see this as a pattern in Scripture, is having a place to do it. And if you don't have a good one, get one. Find one. Decide even in your mind right now, that would be a good place to pray. And say, I'm going to go there. Now again, Jesus had to find the right time, and that's my second thing. Find the right time. Get a regular time. And I've already quoted some of these passages. Early in the morning. Daniel, three scheduled times a day. Right? Even in Psalm 119, seven times a day I give thanks to God for your word. They have scheduled times. Here's where I'm going to do it. I mean, you go to these Middle Eastern countries, even now in America, you see it all the time. The Muslims, it, the, the, the devout ones, they've got their mat and they point in it. You know, and of course, it's not the kind of prayer I'm talking about. But sometimes, doesn't that shame you a little bit when you see these people? You spend enough time in these countries. And there they are. They've got their scheduled time and they pray. Now, they might be praying to the true God. I understand that. But I get a little convicted that it's been a long time since I've FaceTimed with God today. Get a time. Get a regular time. Get a set of times. And then start seeing how long you stay there. Is it more than five minutes? How about a sweet hour of prayer? And again, I'm not quoting a, a hymn authoritatively, but I don't know. Could you maybe rise before dawn this week and say, I'm going to take some time? And I'm going to see if I can pray for an hour. Here's one thing that helps. Number three, faithful partners. Get some prayer partners. Acts chapter 1, I was talking about them. They had a place. They went into the upper room to pray. And they went there together. They gathered in the upper room to pray. Acts chapter 4, they gathered in groups to pray. Acts chapter 12, they gathered at the house of Mary to pray. Paul was in prison. 
singing and praying with Silas. Paul with the Ephesians, having a meeting to pray, gathering at the beach, Acts 21. Get some people to pray. If you're struggling with prayer time, extended prayer time, I challenge our church to, to get four, four people, get three friends, and just say, we're going to be prayer partners. And that's not the gossip time, right? That's not, oh, I'm going to share the prayer request for 30 minutes and then pray for five minutes. It's we're going to just pray. And you know what happens in group prayer time? Even though your mind can drift, I can understand that. You can do a lot of things, but I, I doubt you're going to get up in the middle of that time with those three friends and just kind of walk away. You're like, what happened to Mary? She just left. I mean, there's some built-in accountability there, right? And again, this is a change in the way you live your life. For most of us, it is. If I'm saying getting, I'm getting serious about recommitting myself to prayer, now I'm going to guard that time, and I'm just giving you practical pastoral advice. H have a place, have a time, have some faithful prayer partners. Number four, let me just throw this one in because there's so much about this in Scripture. How about some postures, various postures? I talk about you seeing the Muslims pray. Right, the religiously, you know, legalistic Muslims, I guess you want to call them that, who they have a mat, they face Mecca, they bow down, they go through their, their process. Even the Catholics are right, crossing themselves when they walk in. I'm not suggesting that we get into some ritualistic kind of, of thing, but I find in Scripture there is a lot about the posture of people in praying. Joshua, his face to the ground. Moses with his hands lifted high. Abraham laid out on the ground. Solomon kneeling before God. Hannah standing before God. David sitting before God. And I'm just saying it wouldn't be a bad thing to mix that up and to have a series of postures and say, today I'm going to stand. Today I'm going to pace. Today I'm going to, I'm going to kneel. Today I'm going... I mean, I went out because I, I wanted to... And again, not about my patterns, but... And again, this is probably, the, they're leaning over the rails of heaven and laughing at what I'm about to say. But I went to Home Depot and I got some of those knee pads. Not that I'm a, you know, a carpet layer or anything. Because I, I tried to pray on my knees for a second. Uh, this kind of hurts. Maybe that's just me or maybe I'm just old. But I strapped those knee pads on and I put them underneath the end table next to the sofa where I like to pray and kneel before my, my sofa. And so I pull these out. Sometimes people see those. What are those about? Don't ask, right? These, if I were really godly, I wouldn't need them, but I, I put my knee pads on and pray. Lastly, if the goal is, i just give you five practicals here. If the goal is expressing my thoughts to God, there's several vehicles through which I can do that. So I'm going to call it various modes. I need a good place, a good time. I need faithful prayer partners. I need postures. Various postures would be helpful to guard my prayer and get my alert, attention focused. The various modes of praying. Um, Don Whitney, talking about praying the Psalms or praying the Scriptures. Was it praying the Scriptures or the Psalms, that book he just put out? Pastors? Praying the Psalms? Praying the Bible. Okay, just go for the whole, the whole book. Yeah. That's one way to pray. Have you been taught to do that? It's not hard. You don't need to buy his book to learn, but I mean, and it's a little book. But echoing those psalms. How about writing your prayers out? I got a Word doc on my computer. Just some days I just write out my prayers to God. My wife loves to do that every morning. Get up, see her there, having her time with God, writing her prayers out. To actually talk out loud. Some of you do that, right? Not a bad thing. Get your thoughts to God untangled by talking. Writing, typing, singing, reciting scripture in my prayers, but always taking my thoughts and directing them clearly to God. Recommit yourself to prayer. Guard your prayer time. There's just some pastoral advice and then look at, the la look at the third one here, the last one in verse 2. With an attitude of, what's that one? Thanksgiving. Spend more time in your prayers saying thanks. That's how I put it down on my notes. Spend more time in your prayers saying thanks. When you pray, spend more time saying thanks. 
Speaking of praying without ceasing, listen to this now. I know that everything in my prayers to God should reflect thanksgiving because in verse 18, the next verse, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. So break down your day into all the circumstances of your day and ask yourself the question, how many of these circumstances did I, in those circumstances, give thanks to God? That's prayer, right? It's the essence of worship, too. I'm giving God credit, and I'm telling him that. I mean, we're about to come to Thanksgiving again this year, and I get so tired. And thankfully, you know, we don't watch much TV anymore. Uh, I mean, as a culture, it seems. But... I remember every year listening to like the newscasters in the morning when Thanksgiving rolls around, particularly Thanksgiving at the end of that, they start saying, are you thankful? Are you thankful? I'm thankful. Are you thankful? What are you thankful for? I'm thankful for my family. Are you thankful? All this nonsensical secular talk about Thanksgiving. I was going to raise my hand to who, right? So what what does that even mean? It's like, I'm just thankful, Right? If my kid sits there and is just thankful for his dinner, I'm like, your mother's right there, right? That's the one you need to be thankful toward. It's not you going, oh, I'm so thankful for the mashed potatoes. Mm." Your mother cooked those mashed potatoes. She mashed the mashed potatoes. She served the mashed potatoes. Can you look her in the eye and have a sincere expression of thanksgiving to her? Newscasters are never going to do that. And the world can talk about thanksgiving and they never really give thanks. To be thankful is one thing. To give thanks is another. And that's how it's put. First Thess 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances. So I want to spend more time giving thanks. For what? Well, in all circumstances. But how about this? James 1.17. For every good gift. Why? Because it all comes from him. Every good gift. So if I were to say, let's do some accounting right now. You want to pray for an hour? I know you can spend half an hour easily. If you just say, I first have to start with a little accounting work of seeing what are the good things that God has done, that God has given, that God has provided, that God has allowed me to experience. A lot of bad things. I can understand. Let's save the bad things. Can you start with the good things? Something pops up on my prayer list every day is to be thankful. And I want to keep that vague. I got things I'm specifically thankful for, but I want to, I want to open that up and I want to, I want to ask myself every time I say, oh, was be thankful for what today? And, and it just helps my mind to go, okay, let's think of some things. My life is horrible. I, in, in the pastoral ministry, and, and you should feel for your pastors because it's, you know, they're supposed to get up here and be all cheery and cheer you on. And yet most of what ends up in their office and in their phones and in their phone calls is just the worst of what's happening. You know, we don't get calls during the week like, hey, I'm just having a great Tuesday, Pastor. I wanted to tell you that. All right, it's always the bad stuff. So we get a bunch of people all the time telling us how horrible their life is, how painful, how struggle, how difficult it is. And I get that. But if you're a Christian here, and you may be one of those, You may be saying, everything's just horrible right now. You're in Colossians, right? Are you still there? Can you look at Colossians? Let's start in verse 12, speaking of giving thanks. Let me catch up with you here. You guys are in the NAS, am I right? Because we're real Christians here. Okay, let me get my, let me put aside my, the message that I usually preach from. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I can't sing, but I can pick a decent Bible translation. Verse 12. Middle of all this, right, that he's saying. He gets the context. I'm not violating the context, but in the middle of this sentence, he says, giving thanks to the Father. Now, you could be on your deathbed. Everyone can hate you. People can be walking by to spit on your face. I don't care how bad it is. Okay? You can give thanks to the Father for this. He has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This world isn't what it's about. God is going to bring to us a perfect reality. No mourning, no crying, no pain, no death. All of it's gone. And he has fully qualified you for that. Ask your neighbor if they're going to heaven when they die. What do they say? Hope so. Right? You're supposed to know so. Right? And, and, and even most people, when they get involved in religion, we have to build whole categories to try and appeal to the flesh. Categories like purgatory. There's a good one. 
let's say that we're qualified but not fully qualified. And if you die, you're going to spend some time going through the car wash. Only well, it's going to be water and soap. It's going to be fire. And so you're going to have to burn all that off. You're not fully qualified. Hey, you could, be in the, you could be the thief on the cross. You transfer your trust to Christ. In that moment, you can hear all the way to the depths of your sinful soul. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. What does that mean? What does that infer? It infers you are fully qualified. You can't be any more qualified for heaven than you are right now if you are a genuine Christian. You put your trust in Christ. You've repented of your sins, the sign of real faith in Christ. That's something to be thankful for. How about this, verse 13? He's rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. The domain of darkness... The domain of darkness. Yes, the, do, the domain of darkness. That sounds pretty bad. Well, it's not so bad now. Matter of fact, like Asaph, I can envy the wicked. Look at them. They seem to be doing just fine. They get to go out and do all the stuff my flesh wants to do tonight. Yeah, but they're going to hell. As was pondered in that great psalm, I went to the sanctuary of the Lord and I thought about their end. And when I thought about the end and their destruction, I realized I was like a brute beast before you. What am I thinking the domain of darkness. People are, by nature, children of wrath. The end for them is really bad. And, the, and here's one thing I know. Not only am I not going to purgatory, I'm not going to hell. I deserve to go there. I'm not going. I may have every bad thing that could ever happen in this life to me. I could be being crucified next to Christ. I could be an innocent person, relatively speaking, being crucified as one of the best human beings on the planet and have my limbs torn off. But I know this, I'm not going to hell. Don't fear the one who can kill the body and after that they can't do anything. Fear the one who after he's killed the body can cast your soul into hell. And that one has now become your advocate and he is now the one praying and interceding, Christ is, for you. I mean, having a bad day? You can spend half an hour talking about being, heaven being secured and hell being canceled. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 14. Think about that. In whom we have redemption. You are now redeemed out of that place of being guilty. The forgiveness of sins. How good is it to be forgiven? The mental institutions are filled. The psychiatrist's offices are filled. The therapist's offices are filled with people carrying guilt around. You have no guilt before the Father. Think about that. You confess your sins, he's faithful, faithful and righteous to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Forgiven. Heaven secured, hell canceled. My sin's completely forgiven. You want to be thankful for a few things. It shouldn't be hard for us to say, devote yourselves to prayer, keep alert in it. That's a lot of defensive guarding and careful planning and praying with a thoughtfulness and a guarded attitude, but then with an attitude of thanksgiving. I got a lot to be thankful for gets me in perspective, keeps my prayers in check. Hard for me to go, God, I really want a yacht. Hard for me. I just wish that, you know, you, you ladies, I wish I looked like her. I wish I had a husband like his. Hard for you to go to God with those selfish prayer requests, as James 2 says, you ask with the wrong motives. When you're really, truly thankful and you get around to being thankful about big things, things like heaven being secured, hell being canceled, forgiveness being full and complete in your life. And you got a lot more than that to be thankful for, am I right? A couple things more than that. Gets me in perspective. And I don't have time for this, but that rarely stops me. But verses three and four, back in Colossians four. Can you go back there? And we could go through this if you were a missionary, a pastor. I could say, oh, okay, let's just pray for this. And every Christian, it, this applies to every. But let's just look at the concept. Again, forgive me here for just using this as a simple prompt to think about what Paul's doing. Not just about what he's asking for, but what he's doing. What he's doing is asking for them to take note of some things and pray for those things. At the same time, pray also for us. And he starts listening, that God may open a door for the word, declare the mystery of Christ, and the account of which I'm in prison, and I want to make it clear. So he's got three big things there. And we could go through those, and you could exegete those, and you could figure that out and preach those, and it'd be a great expository sermon. But verse 3, I just want to make the simple observation. 
He's asking for people to pray for specific things. All of this, I really think, to recommit yourself to prayer, to guard your prayer time, and to be thankful, you better have a guided set of things to pray for. In other words, you need to make some prayer lists. Can I at least get you to say that if you're going to commit yourself to prayer, recommit yourself to prayer, resolve to pray, that at least one of the things you choose to do as homework from this assignment, this sermon tonight, is that you say, I'm going to make some lists. I'm going to make some lists. Do you have some prayer lists? Let's get, let's beef that up. Let's get that where it needs to be. And if you don't have a prayer list, I can get you to start really easy. You don't need fancy apps. If you want them, great. They're out there and there's, there's good ones. Ask your Bible study you know, people about it, your small group participants, people you know that are Christians. There's a lot of great things. I can, you can use business apps. You can use you know, your reminders apps on your phone. You can use stuff on your calendar. But write some things down. And if you don't know where to start, let me give you four things. Again, this is practical night. It's, it's not Sunday morning because Sunday morning is never practical it's just ethereal and theoretical and that's why you fall asleep on Sunday mornings and I'm just kidding that's ridiculous sometimes things come out and I say that's a ridiculous thing that I just said it's practical because it's what did I say Saturday night did I say that I thought Saturday what I don't know what night it is is it Friday night four things can I give you four things okay and I've already challenged you to get some prayer partners. So here's a, if you just want to start praying, get your prayer partners and just, let, just ask these questions. Number one, after Thanksgiving, which undergirds everything, here's some specific things to pray. What's lacking in your life? I mean, just ask someone that. What is lacking in your life? Is there anything lacking? Are you lacking anything? Now, it's clear when you go to visit someone at the hospital, they're lacking health, comfort, whatever. But I'll bet anyone in your prayer circle, you pick three or four people to pray with, energy, time, resources, whatever. Yeah, I'm lacking some things. Well, Paul certainly lacked a lot of things and he asked people to pray for that. Number two, I'm just super practical things. Here, What's important coming up in your life? Is there something important coming up in your life? You could text people tonight and ask these four questions. Anything lacking I can be praying for that you want God to supply? And again, if you've got Thanksgiving undergirding it all, they're not going to say a yacht. Right? Really want a big RV, right? That's not what we're talking about. But things that we know that God would want to supply. And then secondly, what's important coming up? We've got something important coming up. I was praying with some folks even today uh, just on, uh, on, and the, sitting on the tarmac. Things were coming up. I knew there were issues coming up, non-Christians in their life that they're going to encounter, family member issues. One gal had a, had a, had a bone uh, biopsy today. I mean, a, I know these things are coming up. So let's pray for those. Number three. Hey, what sinful thing are you fighting? Is there something sinful that you're fighting? We want to lift each other up. We want to guard each other up. We want to protect each other. There needs to be strength in our praying by saying, I want to pray that God would deliver you from evil. I want to pray for you to be strong. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Something lacking, something important, something sinful that you're fighting. And then lastly, just get specific in asking your friends this. Is there something to be thankful for? Give me something I can thank God for for you. You could text someone right now and say, what can I pray for you that's lacking? What can I pray for you that's coming up that's important? What am I praying for that is a sinful temptation in your life? Something sinful you're fighting? And then is there something I can be thankful? Is there an answer to prayer? Is there a victory? Is there a good thing? Is there some kind of progress? What can I pray for? Lacking, important, sinful, and thankful. And again, without even going to certain seminaries that will remain unnamed, L-I-S-T, Lacking, important, sinful, thankful. List. Make a prayer list. Oh, that's way too cute, Pastor Mike. <laughs> but maybe you'll remember it two weeks from now and say, yeah, I need a prayer list. I need to ask my friends things to pray for. I'm going to build a prayer list for my three prayer partners. Great. Luther said, it's the business of tailor to make clothes. It's the business of cobblers to mend shoes. And so it is the business of Christians to pray. You can commit yourself to prayer, but you know that we are weak in our praying. And then I would maybe perhaps leave you with this simple prayer from Charles Spurgeon. An exhortation about our prayer lives, to be specific. He says, do we not all find ourselves in a cold state in reference to prayer? Of course we do. Brothers, I believe that when we cannot pray, we say we can't pray, 
it's time that we prayed all the more. But if you answered, how can that be? How can that be? How am I going to pray when I can't pray? I would say, Spurgeon said, pray to pray. Pray for prayer. Pray for the spirit of supplication. Do not be content to say, I would pray if I could. No, but if you cannot pray, pray until you can. And that's been my prayer for this conference this weekend, is that we will pray. It starts with a resolved prayer. Let's pray right now. God, I pray for that very thing, that we would pray. And I pray that not just for this congregation, this conference, this group. I pray it for my life. I pray it for my staff. I pray it for my family. Please give us a spirit of supplication. Let us pray at all times in the spirit. We want to be in step with your spirit and pray for the things that really can be said to be in Jesus' name. We want to resolve to pray and be practical about things that are going to help us, things that will guard our prayer lives, things even just like prayer partners, that I'm going to say this is not a time just to chit-chat about other people. It's a time for us just to pray together. And then, God, to really commit myself to that kind of texting prayer, that kind of periodic, habitual, constant, like a hacking cough, the prayer that my mind keeps coming back, not just to who can I text or who can I talk to or something happened, who can I tell, but saying, I got you to tell. I want to tell you. I want to bring you those thoughts. And then, of course, God, the hardest thing of all for us, it seems, the flesh is weak, the spirit presses against us, and the world certainly doesn't help with all of its distractions. We have a hard time being committed to concentrated praying. So may that be a part of what comes from this conference this weekend is that we would learn to have a more disciplined time of concentrated prayer. If that means we're taking our phones and our iPads and putting them in a drawer in another room and crawling into a closet, getting in the car and driving to some desolate place. If it means going up into a part of a office in a corner of our our workplace and just saying, I'm going to pray for the next 20 minutes here. Just get us in that undistracted state to pray. And God, if we do it once a day, let us not be content with that. Let us have that increasing desire and hunger to pray like Daniel three times a day, found in his upper chamber praying with his window open, praying toward Jerusalem. God, help us to pray toward the new Jerusalem, to know that you the King of Kings that's gone to prepare a place for us, Christ, that you were there, that you're coming for us, and at any moment you could arrive. God, we want to pray. We want to pray that you're a great God. Hallowed be your name, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done. God, that we would pray for our daily bread, that we would pray not to be led into temptation, that we pray for forgiveness. God, so many things we need to be praying for, but just first let it begin this weekend with a resolve to pray. Let us be that kind of people that take your word seriously, that read four words on a page and say, that's directed to us and we just need to do it. God, we know we need to guard it. We need some help. We need your spirit to empower us. We need to pray that you would help us to be people of prayer. So maybe that, may that be the result, God, please. Hear our prayer for prayer. Hear our request that we might be men and women of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.